Hi there. It's time for the August garden tour for the middle sized garden where I share with you the things I've learned this month and I hope that'll help you too. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Size Garden YouTube channel and blog with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden from real gardens. Here in the Middle Size Garden in South East England, it roughly equates to a USA hardiness zone of eight or nine, but it has been really, really hot for the last month. It sometimes got as high as 33 degrees Celsius, which would be about sort of 90 in Fahrenheit. It's been one of the hottest Julys since record began and the garden is beginning to look a bit baked. And then every so often the whole weather's broken and we've had a massive storm. And at one point the parasol was yanked out of the table where, and then flew across the garden and landed on the bird feeder, which is now broken. And as you can see, the parasol doesn't look very well either. And then it was all back to baking again. So the garden's been on fast forward and the dahlias are out, but sadly, not as many as I usually have. Now, I don't usually dig up my dahlias. I've done a video on this showing how you can not dig up your dahlias and you can cover them with a thick layer of mulch and it usually works really well. However, last winter, I'm afraid I did not mulch all my dahlias. I mulched some of them and then I got busy and I stopped. And the result is that the ones that weren't mulch did die because it was quite a severe winter. The ones that were mulched have come through fantastically, but I have got gaps, which is unusual. The lavender has been fantastic in the last month. And in last month's garden tour, I said that I had noticed there were fewer pollinators in my lavender. Well, it did pick up towards the middle of the month. It was wonderful to see more pollinators in the garden. And we also saw a most beautiful striped Jersey tiger moth, which used to only be in one tiny part of Britain and is about slowly spreading over the southeast. However, we've now cut the lavender down and uh, once again, I don't do what a lot of the gardening experts tell you to do, which is to be very careful not to cut your lavender into the brown. Actually, if you want neat, bushy clumps of lavender, which really are going to last, you do need to cut back quite severely. What's very important is that you make sure that there's at least one bud left there. I've done a video on this and you can check that out, uh, but it does make your lavender last longer and look much neater if you do a fairly hard cut. With the lavender cut, the panicum, the grasses in the pots now take centre stage and these come into their own just about now. This is called panicum shenandoah and I've had it in these pots for three years so it's been fantastically easy to look after and it has these great spires of grass and grass heads and they turn slightly red striped hence the Shenandoah name and I love seeing the seed heads gently flicker in the sunlight and these will be like this until about March so they are fantastic for all year round colour. A week ago, we had wonderful colour from the daylilies and the crocosmia. Now, those are over now, but I just had to show you what they looked like. The crocosmia here pretty much self-seeds, and so do the daylilies. They just spread fantastically. But sadly, both have gone now, so the border isn't looking as good, which means that I'm really appreciating my north-facing border, which is really just mainly greens. And I just love this combination of cypress, rosa glauca, these lovely white pom-poms of Hydrangea arborescence Annabelle, the lovely pale citrusy green of the liquid amber tree. It's just a great combination. Of course, it goes on for months because it's not really dependent on flowering, except for the hydrangeas. And Hydrangea Annabelle, once again, it'll go dried over the winter. So I'll have that actual interest really until I cut it back in March. I wouldn't say my veg garden has been particularly successful, but there's one thing I thought you might like to see, which is companion planting. I let nasturtiums self-seed in the veg patch and I was picking some courgettes and I noticed that the courgettes near the nasturtiums don't have as many aphids and black fly as the ones which are nowhere near the nasturtium. Now, companion planting is about planting plants which attract or deter insects from your plants that you want to keep. So the idea is that nasturtiums attract aphids and therefore they don't go on your courgettes. Now, there isn't, I think, a great deal of good science about all of this, but I have to say in my garden, I've really noticed it. 
Um, and there's been a bit of a bonus on the fruit front, owing to the fact that we are not terribly good weeders, either me or my neighbour on the other side, a huge bramble has grown in our mutual wall. Now, this is quite dangerous. It could pull the wall apart. So it has to go. But we're just giving it a few more weeks because the most wonderful blackberries have been coming out. It's actually so hot that I've had to bring my mobile phone, which is what I film on, back into the kitchen because if I'm outside in the potting shed, it's just too hot to film. I have been putting my phone into the fridge to keep it working, but I'm not sure that's really good for it. Back in my white bed, the pink Japanese anemone is doing really well. It's called Honorine, Honorine Juba, and I'll put plant names in the description below. And I have dug this up twice, completely got every single bit of it out of the bed, and planted lovely white plants in it and it's just come crashing back. So uh, just a warning, Japanese anemone, very pretty, the pollinators love it, but once you've got it, you've really got it. The vine climbing over the back of the house is a Virginia creeper and it's called Parthenocissus henriana. It's a slightly more blue tinged one than the more usual Virginia creeper, which is also called American ivy. And it isn't quite as rampant. I mean, it is pretty fast growing, but it's not quite as rampant. Houses in the Victorian times were always covered in Virginia creeper and then in the 20th century people decided that it might damage the brick. In fact it doesn't damage the brick and now people think actually it does protect the brick. So uh, we're growing it up the back of the house really and it's a lovely thermal insulating material only in the summer. It does keep the house cool. Sadly the leaves are off in the winter so it doesn't keep the house warm. I hope you've enjoyed this and if you have do press like because then I know you'd like to see more garden tours and we've got lots of projects coming up. We're building a garden table and I'm going to interview some head gardeners about late autumn season colour. So if you haven't subscribed to the Middle Size Garden, do join us. We upload every Saturday with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So hope to see you there. Thank you. Bye.